Oh, now I got you. Yeah. How's the volume? A little too loud. Brandon. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the conversation. This will be fun. How does a veteran know whether or not to go back to school? How do you make that delineation? Well, look, uh, you know, there, there's a couple things. I mean, higher ed obviously is one prominent path that that helps propel people into better jobs. And and but there's also quite quite a few jobs out there right now, many of which are very high paying jobs and uh, and in fruitful careers, right? That require something short of an actual degree. So if you think about industry recognized credentials, you know, certainly thinking right. about the the very hot, fast growing field of cybersecurity. Cyber, yeah. You know, there, there are a lot of pathways into very productive jobs that are short of an actual degree. Um, and so, you know, that's an area where I think there's just much less visibility in terms of, you know, how do I get access to that? But there's a growing marketplace of nonprofit, for-profit providers, even universities that are getting into the, you know, credentialing space short of degrees, which I think is going to be a productive path. I think we all would agree that the college degree is kind of a default. You know, if, you've, if you were, you know ambitious enough to, or persistent enough to make it through the four to maybe six years of, of college to <laughs> please, graduate. Please, 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 I got three kids. Four is enough for each one. <laughs> and, uh, then, you know, that's kind of a filter is yeah. kind of completion. And yeah. so I think that is, it's a problem, a bit of a problem. Um, I think there's a trend that, particularly in tech hiring, that is really positive is skills-based interviewing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And nobody who's serious about hiring in a tech environment is not putting some kind of uh, problem in front of the, in front of the candidate. If you're hiring an engineer, you can say you went and did all these things, but you're going to be given a problem. Yeah. And you have to solve that problem and submit that problem. That's a great opportunity, I think, for non-traditional backgrounds. And we're starting to see that more in other account management. Like if you're going to be, you have to do an Excel problem to prove that you can do something. And I think there's an interesting balancing, a calibrating to say, hey, let me take the test. There's a really exciting company called Catalyte. It's based in Baltimore. And their claim is that anybody who can take their assessment test and score high enough on the cognitive skills, they'll train you for free to become a software developer. Mm -hmm. And they're getting a broad background of people from all sorts of um, backgrounds who most didn't have college degrees. So I think there's a way for us to think about skills assessment up front in the hiring flow that would help us calibrate some of these That's things great. and hire better people yeah. who ultimately are better fits because yeah. a bad fit is not going to be long-term employment. I've heard, you know, particularly with respect to cyber, that almost any industry will look at somebody that has what they call skill-adjacent uh, capabilities. So if you're in retail cool and you've worked word. in a retail store, yeah. the retailer will teach you the technology that they need if, if you need to prevent hacking of customer data. How, how do they take those skills and marry them to, as you say, a, a particular certificate that makes them valuable to a particular industry? Well, look, I mean, as we talked about higher ed needing to do a better job recognizing prior learning from the military, right? You know, uh, em employers, I think, need to do a better job in how they describe job descriptions in posted jobs, okay? Uh, because you have, gonna, yeah, you, you know, <clears throat> right, like yeah. they're actually not very articulate yeah. about what's required in the yes. job. You know, they'll say a bachelor's degree required right. in a lot of these job descriptions or minimum of five years experience. But the point is you see somebody that can do the job if you can actually evaluate whether they can do the job or do a better job evaluating adjacent skills that could get them there quicker. Employers are not very sophisticated in, 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 in that manner, right? So and, that, and that's- They're yeah. becoming I, I will, more, I will more tell sophisticated. You, I will tell you, they're, they're on that's their a, way, but That's yeah. exactly one of the things that we do at SHRM is when we address our HR professionals is, is one of the very first things you need to do in your organization is look in and sort of, if you will, right size your job descriptions. Yeah. Really go back and analyze them. Does the job description really fit what that job does and what you need it to do? and then cut out that superfluous stuff, right. you know? If so it, you want if, the essence of the job? If you want the essence of the job, and if, if, if it really does not require a bachelor's degree, then say that, right. then, and recognize that, and then implement that in a very real way. Or at least be open to it, as opposed to required. Right. Right. And, right, it could still be recommended, but yeah. Yeah, yeah the, then the skill, to, to your point, the skill adjacent piece, if the, your point, HR representative or the hiring manager is not trained, then a lot of times they don't see the adjacent uh, angle. They don't right. understand, right. oh, this is actually directly related. And a lot of this stuff is rubber meets the road where it's somebody sitting, you know, at seven o'clock at night looking through 15, 20, 30, 100 resumes 
trying to make a decision. And if we're not prepared at that point of attack, then folks are just going to go with whomever they are most familiar with, whatever skill or training they've had, et cetera. Right. And, and, and that's like part the, of, that is really part of what we try to train is, is be aware of the skill adjacent kind of things. We as employers have to make our job descriptions military friendly. Yeah. We need to have a That's line that say says right. military mm -hmm. uh, experience welcome, military right. experience desired, but or, we, we hear or about that, commensurate. We hear, like, Starbucks hiring 11,000 military, or we hear about other companies, Comcast as well, you know, making it a, a statement, making it a point mm -hmm. that they're hiring veterans. Does it always translate though into permanent employment? I, I think yes. These companies that are, are attuned to these needs and have put that on their job descriptions or attuned to a lot of the other needs. But what is it, 80% of our veterans are hired by small to medium businesses? It's those that we have to help. It's not the Starbucks, the USAA, the Comcast, the NBC, because we've been there trying to work through this, Toyota. But it's small to medium businesses. We need to help them to translate their job descriptions to be much more military friendly and to uh, welcome veterans. Because one thing the studies have shown is that our veterans, if they look at a job description and don't meet 100% of the, because they're used to job skills in the military, if they don't read 100% of their uh, prerequisites, they won't apply. Mm -hmm. We talk about long-term employment and ensuring that these, these jobs are durable. What's incumbent upon, from the private sector's perspective, ensuring some sustainability of employment? Yeah, look, I mean, I think there are great examples of primarily large employers who, you know, have started to make large investments in education and training on a lot of levels. Reskilling, upskilling, we use a lot of language around this, right? So in general, there's a very positive movement of kind of top employers that are going in that direction. To your point, right, you don't really see the same thing among small and medium-sized employers who, you know, are doing the majority of that hiring, right, um, and, and don't have the types of resources uh, or you know, the divisions focused on learning and training. And so somehow we've got to figure out how to potentially have uh, an opportunity for military uh, veterans who are leaving the military to actually come with funding to an employer for non-degree programs as well. Right. And I feel like there's also the, the element of method. So we're talking about getting better at assessing the skills, but then there's also the question of how do we educate employers? How do we educate our, our fellow veterans on what that space is? How are you better preparing yourself and presenting yourself? And one of the things we do at JP Morgan, we have a, we have a powerful team internally, the military and veterans affairs team that focuses on the population inside the company, but they have reached out to those of us who are not on that team to kind of educate us and teach us, hey, this is, the po this is what we're finding. I may be a veteran, but maybe I don't know all the best practices around how to reach out to the community. And now we find out that we're interjecting that into the relationships that we build on the philanthropic side, because now we're thinking, wait a second, how are you working with military veterans? Are you using the best practices? And we'll partner with our HR business partners. And then as we start to fund schools, you know, hey, we're, we're funding you for, for an educational purpose, but how are you working with this discrete population? All right, joining us now also is James Lynch, who served as a Huey pilot in combat. Jim, you have a question about education for Brandon, correct? Uh, yes. With all the emphasis on technical education uh, and those opportunities, I just wanted to, to see is, is the opportunity still alive for uh, liberal arts graduates coming out of the military in terms of where they can go? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not it, just the military, by the no, way. No, no, no. It's being a asked. super <laughs> interesting question. I, and I, I'm so glad you asked it. I, literally, I just I published an article on research we did around this that tells an interesting story, right? So. There's a negative narrative about liberal arts. It's not about the underlying pedagogy of liberal arts. It's the words. It's got a bad brand, right? Like if you think about liberal and arts and stick it together, and I've written articles about it, it's a bad brand name. But the actual essence of a liberal arts degree, right, when you say, well, what, what does it help somebody do? The, you quickly say things like critical thinking, skilled communication, right? You know, and it, these are things that employers value now more than ever. So you talk about LinkedIn, they did big analysis of all the jobs that were posted. The top and most in-demand skills are actually these soft skill things, right? What we've called soft skill things. And so what's interesting though in this uh, research we did, we asked uh, people to imagine being a hiring manager. We said, okay, of these three graduates, which one would you be most likely to hire? You know, nothing else. Uh, a graduate with a bachelor's degree in English, a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity, which is obviously a white hot type of degree right now, or uh, someone with an English major who has a designation in cybersecurity. And it was a landslide victory 
for the English major with a cybersecurity designation. In other words, what it tells you is employers greatly value that liberal arts degree, but what they want to see is some evidence that there's also a hard skill set attached to it. So actually, the idea of somebody who's a military veteran with a liberal arts degree, that's kind of a home run in terms of the marketing package of that right now.